this is a chord. If we add this note, we get a seventh chord, since that's the seventh scale degree. You can keep going, adding a ninth or an eleventh, but what's the biggest chord you can possibly have? Let's find out. On December 31st, 2018, I released a song called Moving Day. Here's the opening chord. Its name is this. That's a pretty big chord. It uses 11 of the 12 tones of 12th at only omitting an F natural. So did it work? Was it good? Well, yeah, people really liked Moving Day. Even though the first thing people heard was probably a chord larger than they had ever heard before, the video has 38 likes and zero dislikes, and the YouTube music king himself, Andrew Huang, said it was good. Anyway, why am I telling you this? Am I just bragging? Eh, maybe, probably, but the point is this. Very large chords can be used effectively and musically. I have experience doing so. This isn't just about a useless, nebulous, theoretical construct. This is real stuff that you can use. However, perhaps the most important point to get across in this video, ironically, is that big chords are not the answer to everything. I may have started Moving Day with a truly gargantuan chord, but it was the only chord in the whole song bigger than a 13th, and I ended Moving Day on a justly intonated D major triad. Just D major, not even a 7th chord. Tension and resolution is how you make compelling music, and if you use these giant chords too often, they will fail you. But come on, the question we're here for, what's the biggest? What is the largest possible chord? For a little while here, we'll be discussing practical things, but by this timestamp, we'll be getting into chords that are absolutely never going to be practical since they will escape the range of human hearing. I'll be going through several different interpretations of this question, because this question doesn't have just one answer. This video is not exhaustive. I will only be covering tertian chords in 12 tet, meaning I'm using standard western tuning, and I'm only talking about chords built on minor and major thirds. Tone clusters, Fritz Heinrich Klein, different tuning systems, chordal harmony, all those things are cool and interesting, and I might make a second part to this video in the future addressing them, but for now, tertian chords in 12 tet. Interpretation 1. Classic Lydian. George Russell is well known for his Lydian chromatic concept of tonal organization, which explains harmony in relation to the Lydian mode. Links in the description for more on that. The essential idea is that the Lydian mode is what you get if you just start on a root and go through the first seven notes in the circle of fifths, making it the default. So if you want to build a big, bright chord, you play each note of a Lydian scale going up by thirds. In this interpretation, the 13th chord is the biggest chord. And the reason is that if you were to continue with your stacking of thirds according to the Lydian mode, you'd repeat yourself. This is an important point for all of the interpretations in this video. Repetition is not allowed. If you allow repetition, the answer is always going to be infinity. That's not useful or interesting, so repetition is not allowed. And what we'll soon see is that the key to the different interpretations is how we define repetition. And this is a good spot to mention why I will disregard enharmonics. Many notes have more than one name, but I only care about the frequency. I don't care about differentiating C sharp from D flat. The reason for this is that if we use enharmonically correct note names, we could go infinitely far in a few ways, one of which is stacking minor thirds for an infinite diminished chord. As the voices go up, we would have to add extra flats so quickly that no note name would ever get repeated, so no enharmonics. We'll still have to call notes by names, and we'll have to choose whether to call them with flats or sharps, but bear in mind that ultimately it doesn't matter which we use for the purpose of finding the largest possible chord. The 13th chord is the largest chord you'll see used commonly. It can, in most contexts, even complex jazz, be treated as the effectively largest chord. Now something to notice about this Lydian 13th chord is that it alternates between major and minor thirds. At the bottom, a major third, then a minor, then a major, all the way up. If we were to stick to the classic 7 note Lydian scale, we would not be able to continue this alteration going past the 13th, since the note a third up from here is just C, and we would then have two minor thirds in a row. 
So what happens if we skip that C and keep alternating? Interpretation 2. Super Lydian. Jacob Collier describes Super Lydian as raising the 15th, so that you can build one extra voice on the 13th chord for something like this. If you continue to alternate over and over again, you can go quite a bit farther. Collier calls this the Super Ultra Hyper Mega Meta Lydian, but we'll just call it Hyper Lydian for now. The biggest chord you can get before repeating yourself with this is a 47th chord. This way of notating it is enharmonically correct, but as you can see, we have to deal with double sharps and that's ugly, so since we don't actually care about enharmonics, let's write it like this. Now you can think of it as a flat 7 major 7 over flat 6 major 7 over flat 5 major 7 over 3 major 7 over 2 major 7 over 1 major 7, a sextuple polychord. This is pretty big, and it takes up almost the entire piano. If you were to repeat the chord again, starting on that high C8, you would actually escape human hearing relatively quickly. This might be the limit as far as useful chords go. I don't know if you'd ever play the whole thing at once, but the concept of Hyperlydian certainly is useful. That's what I used for the opening chord to Moving Day, and Jacob Collier frequently uses this to what I think is a great effect. Friend of the channel, Leon Waves, made a great video about this chord in particular, which I'll link in the description. But what is the biggest chord we could physically hear? Interpretation 3. Human Hearing Range it turns out that the total human hearing range, meaning the lowest note anyone can hear up to the highest note anyone can hear, is 20 hertz, or cycles per second, up to 20,000 hertz. This means in 12 debt, the lowest note we can hear is an E0, and the highest a D sharp 10, almost exactly a 10 octave span. So, it turns out going from E0 to D sharp 10 using major and minor thirds results in a chord with 35 voices, or a 69th chord. I played it there with sine waves, but here it is with a piano. And here with a gnarly super saw. Yowzer. This little formula will be useful going forward. It gives us the numerical identifier of a chord with the number of voices. The numerical identifier is just the number part of the name of the chord. It comes from the scale degree of the top note in the chord. For instance, the top note of a tertian chord with four voices is the seventh scale degree. This means we call it a seventh chord, and seven is the numerical identifier. For a thirteenth chord, the numerical identifier would be thirteen, and for a forty-ninth chord, it would be forty-nine. Now to show that this really will always work, take a look at the diminished seventh chord. The top voice of a diminished seventh chord is a double flat seventh, but it's still called a seventh. A diminished seventh chord is still a seventh chord. The top voice is enharmonic with the sixth, but we don't call it a sixth chord because it's a tertian chord with four voices, and four times two minus one is seven. So, I think it's fair to say that whatever accidentals are necessary, two V minus one is the way to go for getting the numerical identifier. And now, things get real. Interpretation four, absolute repetition of pitch class groups. It might sound fancy, but it's actually really easy. All this is talking about is taking a sequence, or group, of note names and making sure that sequence of note names only shows up once in the chord. Pitch class is the technical term used here. A pitch class is something like D, which represents the entire set or collection of all Ds across all octaves, whereas a note, or pitch, is something like D5. One of those is octave arbitrary, or octave equivalent, while the other is octave specific. If we defined our sequences, or groups, based on repetition with octave specific notes, we could actually go on forever, because the octave would keep changing forever. So when we're talking about repeating notes, we're really talking about repeating pitch classes. I'll refer to them as notes, but just keep that in mind. So for a group size of 1, the answer is pretty clear. A chord with 12 voices, or a 23rd chord, would be the largest possible, since there are only 12 possible one-note groups. Here's an example of one such chord. For a group size of 2, we can go a lot bigger. There are 24 possible two-note groups in our context, since we have 12 possible starting notes for each group, and the two notes in each group can be separated by either a major or minor third, two options, therefore 12 times 2. 
Here, the largest chord possible is a 49th chord with 25 voices. This is because after the first note, every single note you add on top of it must create a brand new two note group. If any two note group created isn't unique, then we have a repetition and that's not allowed. So to fill in all 24 possible two note groups, you must add exactly 24 more notes after the first one for a total of 25. Since you've now exhausted all possible two note groups, adding any more voices will repeat a two note group, so you're done at 25. There's actually a general formula for this. 12 times 2 to the power of g minus 1 plus g minus 1 equals the maximum number of voices. Multiply this by 2 and subtract 1 and you have your chord name. This 2 to the g minus 1 is the number of possible shapes with a group size g, since the number of intervals in that group is one less than the number of notes, and there are two possibilities for each interval. This 12 is because there are 12 possible notes to start on, and this extra g minus 1 is because you don't start adding those different groups of size g until you get up to g number of voices, so you get the first g minus 1 voices for free. Feel free to pause here, this is a pretty dense spot. I've actually also figured out examples for the largest chords with group sizes 3 and 4. The way I did this is pretty complicated and not really suited for this video, but if you're dying to know, you can ask me and I'll make a video on it just for you. These chords are really big, and they both actually sound just like the 69th chord, since they're both larger than human hearing, but here they are arpeggiated with lots of octave jumps to keep them in hearing range. Now, this is all cool, but there's still a bit of an issue. This formula puts us back into infinity, because the group size you pick is arbitrary. And if you pick a group size of a million, well, all of a sudden you've got a chord where the number of voices is a 300,000 digit long number. That's still finite, but you could go as far as you wanted, and there's no definite ceiling here. So let's try one more thing. Interpretation 5. Consecutive repetition. Absolute repetition means that if there's a group of pitch classes somewhere in the chord, you shouldn't be able to find that group anywhere else. Consecutive repetition means that you shouldn't be able to find a group of pitch classes right next to itself. Here's a quick example to demonstrate this. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3 has consecutive repetition of 1, 2, 3, but 1, 2, 3, 7, 1, 2, 3 does not. It has absolute repetition of 1, 2, 3, since 1, 2, 3 does show up twice, but because of that 7 in the middle, it's not consecutive repetition. Consecutive repetition is a group followed immediately by another group identical to itself. Now for this consecutive repetition definition, there's no one group size. We're looking for a chord where no group of pitch classes of any size consecutively repeats. Now, finding the maximum size of this type of chord is very hard. And spoiler, I don't know how to prove the answer. I don't know what the max is, or even if there is a finite maximum, but there's a lot of interesting stuff to show anyway. I made a computer program to generate and test chords for consecutive repetition. What you need to know is that it outputs the chords as a string of digits, not as a list of pitch classes as we would normally read them. At first, I tried using base 12 digits, but then I realized this is music theory, so I should probably be using the digits of set theory, which use T and E instead of A and B. Each digit represents a relative pitch class, relative meaning that one will always represent the pitch class a half step above zero, but it doesn't really matter what zero is. Could be F sharp to G, or C to D flat, or any other two. In this notation, a minor seventh chord will look like this. The intervals of a minor seventh chord are minor third, major third, minor third. Since minor thirds are three half steps and major thirds are four half steps, we can see how this works. From zero to three is three, that's a minor third. From three to seven is four, that's a major third. And from seven to T, which stands for 10, is three, another minor third. If we were to assign the digit zero to the pitch class C, this would be what each digit represented. As you can see here, that would mean we have C, E flat, G, and B flat, exactly the notes of a C minor seventh chord. Here's all the largest chords we've covered so far in this set theory notation.
The number of calculations needed to check for consecutive repetition goes up by the square of the size of the chord in question, and this means it actually takes a very long time to check chords with tens of thousands of voices, but after doing some tricky things to skip a lot and get big chords quickly, I ran the program for about 8 hours, and at the end it had produced this chord, whose numerical name you saw in the thumbnail. This is an absolute behemoth with 41,761 voices. And because this video is only 720p, it's pretty hard to even make out what the digits are. Yowzer once again. Now is there hope to prove one way or another that there is a finite limit to non-consecutively repeating tertian chord sizes in 12-tet? I don't know. I've been working on this on and off for about a month at this point, and I've had some promising leads, but it's a very hard problem. The absolute repetition equation took me about an hour to figure out, but this is a whole different beast. If you're interested in attacking the math problem, here's the formal version of the question. It feels like it should be infinite, especially after getting such huge chords out of the program, but I can't prove it. In sum. In my opinion, I think the 49th chord, the largest possible tertian chord where there is no absolute repetition of any group of two pitch classes, makes the most sense to conclude as the largest, since the building blocks of tertian chords are thirds, and this chord contains all possible thirds in 12-tet. The most useful concept, I think, unsurprisingly, seeing as I've used it myself, is hyperlydian. This is a really cool idea that can take your harmony to some really interesting places, and I implore you to explore it. I have a new channel called AC Music Theory where I will upload a copy of each theory video I do here. That way, if you only want to see my theory content but not my music content, you can subscribe there and not here, hit the bell there and not here, and everybody wins. Everybody wins that way. I think long term I actually want to just diverge the channels completely so that um, I won't upload theory here at all. It'll just go to AC Music Theory and, um, and then I'll upload just my music to this channel. That way everybody has options. So if you just want to see my music, uh, you also have that option. Uh, I don't think there's as many people who just want to see my music and not my music theory as there are who just want to see my music theory and not my music, but just giving everybody options like that uh, is probably a good plan, and uh, I think it'll also work better for me because it's just easier to systemize everything. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's probably a plan going forward, but the channel is up, and this video, a copy of this video um, without this clip in it, is on that channel as well. Uh, so yeah. Thank you so much for watching. This video has taken an enormous amount of time to make, so um, I appreciate you watching very much. I know it's a long video, but hopefully I kept your engagement the way through. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of editing as I'm filming this, but uh, I, I've already done so much work on it before editing. There was, you know, there was the script. Writing the script took a long time. The script was over 3,000 words. So, you know, it wasn't a small task writing the script, but probably the biggest task actually was just doing the research and doing the problem solving ahead of time. Like with the consecutive repetition stuff, I mean, that's, that took a really long time. Um, and I still haven't actually solved it. And, uh, you know, that might feel bad. You know, I kind of get it. That doesn't feel great that we didn't really get a final answer. And yeah, I mean, I really want one. And I think I, think I can prove it. I just can't do it yet. And, um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I'll probably come back to this in the future. Um, but I, I think it was still a valuable video, and I think the Hyperlydian concept certainly is, is pretty cool. Um, just the idea of building those thirds and alternating them continuously, and, and how that can affect your harmony. It really worked in Moving Day, as you saw. So, yeah. Um, there you go. Again, thank you so much for watching. See you next time. Bye.